um, the Silosolve Safe program. So obviously, I mean, we're in the business to sell silage inoculants, but uh, those of us that have participated heavily in the Safe program and uh, presented this as added value to our customers have not only seen increases in sales, but have seen uh, very happy customers and customers that are engaged uh, with us that are engaged at the uh, farm level and I'm talking about owners that are participating with their uh, with their workers and with their custom contractors that are coming in and that sets the tone and if you can get to that level um, as we have with some of, the, uh, of our better accounts out in the in the western U.S. I know we've done this. Uh, we're you know what I consider bulletproof from a sales standpoint. Uh, we're considered a valuable resource on that farm, and they want us there. And they come to the meetings and participate in it because they understand the value of this. So, you know, this all really stems on making sure that we're taking care of the employees. So it might be last on our list, but it's probably one of the most important things. And if you can get yourself uh, with your clients to this level, and uh, if you need help uh, understanding what I'm talking about, talk to Greg Jones. Um, when you get to this level, um, it, pricing's not an issue. It, it, it just, it's where we want to be with our customers, but ultimately they appreciate this because just no one else in the industry is bringing information of their employees. So we always want to start out when we're discussing this is that we're not safety trainers, right? I mean, none of us are certified in any way, shape or form, and we're just trying to uh, raise awareness on the farm. We're not trying to replace their current uh, policies. We're not trying to change anything that's on farm. I don't want anybody to come out of one of these meetings and say, well, Eric said that that's no, that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to provide a source of information, a third party source from the Bolson Safety Foundation to get more information in people's hands and hopefully help them make better choices and be safer uh, while they follow the company's uh, farm policies for, for safety. And again, this is the basis of our program. It comes from the Bolson Safety Foundation. You can find more information here. I know everybody on this call is familiar with who Dr. Bolson was, but uh, it's always important to share that information with the customers because uh, a lot of a lot of times people go, oh yeah, I remember that guy. I hadn't seen him in forever. Where is he? Well, he passed away. But you know, we're wanting to keep the legacy of Dr. Bolson moving forward with this. So there is a board of directors that goes along uh, with with the program and uh, trying to keep things going forward. I saw that uh, Dr. Wagner with K-State just uh, had a nice article in Feedlot Magazine that just was published. So um, all related to silage safety in the feed yards, <clears throat> but based on obviously this information. So when we talk about silage safety, you know, we, we got to understand what it is. And, and, and safety is just trying to control hazards that we know exist. And we've got to do that within an acceptable level of risk. I mean, Bolson always used to say, like, we're not going to wrap everybody in bubble wrap and, and helmets and, and not be able to get our jobs done. But we know what the risks are. So let's, let's develop an acceptable level of risk uh, around that hazard that we're dealing with. Because most of our accidents, honestly, are... are caused by unsafe behaviors. We know that uh, climbing up a, a ladder with muddy boots is a risk. Now we take that risk sometime, but what, you know, if we would just say, okay, I'm gonna clean my boots before I climb up this ladder, well, then I've taken the risk out. So we know that these accidents, you know, mostly are behaviors that we choose uh, incorrectly uh, to do. Uh, speed. Speed tends to be one of the biggest problems that we deal with in any of these accidents, whether it's on farm, whether it's in our daily lives, walking up or down the stairs, driving in our vehicles. Uh, speed is a contributing factor to a tremendous amount of our accidents. So uh, take that into consideration when you're trying to drive home from Clovis, New Mexico, and get home to Lubbock before 5 p.m., right? We we all do these things um, on these back roads. I. I'm guilty as anybody uh, of driving too fast, but it's a risk that we're taking and uh, that's when our accidents occur. So everybody be safe out there this year, especially as we know trucks are going to be coming in and out of the uh, fields and hitting the roads uh, just minute by minute everywhere we're, that we're out working. So 
you know, we, we don't really have a good amount of records of these uh, accidents, especially in regards to silage. I actually pulled up the OSHA website looking at, uh, or no, it was Department of Labor, I'm sorry, Department of Labor statistics uh, this morning, and it listed every single accident, but they have not updated it since the end of April. So um, not really sure why, but you could go through and just, uh, and it's sad, but it's a laundry list of every single accident, every single person, where it occurred, the date, the time. I mean, you can find all this information, but that database does not exist for silage accidents. So the best, uh, the best use that we have is Google to try to go find these. So uh, not to be morbid, but if anybody knows or finds out about any new accidents in your area, please share them with me because we want to keep track of these things because they're just, again, there's no, there's no reporting um, source that keeps track of these. But we know that these accidents are continuing to increase, it appears. And uh, again, our goal here is to just practice safety, share this information with everything, uh, with everybody, because we've got nothing to lose by, by being safe, but we have everything to lose by being unsafe when we're out on farms. Uh, Dr. Bolson identified these key areas of awareness and uh, specifically related to silage. And so we're going to go through them briefly here. And the first one is fatigue. And we all know the old saying that uh, we got to make hay while, while the sun shines, right? Which means we're working a lot of long hours. And, and obviously silage fits that criteria uh, for sure, right? We're starting very early in the morning. We're going very late at night. Uh, we're trying to, we got to get this crop out and packed and into the bunker, but that means some seriously long hours. So um, highly recommend to our clients and customers that they take a break. I know many of you, uh, I'm thinking of a long haired guy in California that does this all the time that takes uh, water bottles out, Gatorades, uh, milk, goes out and stops and sees the crews. And I know he's, you know, trying to be nice to him, but one of the things he's doing is he's giving them a free break in the middle of the day when they got to stop because they got this guy running out there to hand them a Gatorade and a bottle of water, but staying hydrated, uh, eating properly throughout the day, uh, having these kids show up with Snickers and Monster Energy Bars is probably not the right diet to drive a three quarter million dollar chopper through the field. So having discussions with people about making sure that they're staying uh, properly hydrated, properly uh, fed, but getting enough rest so that they are uh, ready to do their jobs. Uh, preventing fatigue is a huge uh, way to help prevent accidents. So here's an example of a family uh, custom harvesting group in Kansas taking a break. Um, and it also gives you an opportunity to not only get hydrated and uh, fed, but also have discussions about what's working, what's not working, how do we keep the, the rest of the afternoon going well. And complacency is a real problem in our industry. Uh, here's an example from a nutritionist that uh, most of us knew in Texas that uh, had been in a bunker many times and then had an accident when the bunker fell on him and, and broke several bones. But you know, complacency is not just those kinds of things. I mean, we've all been in feed yards, you know, millions of times and dairies millions of times, and then the feed truck comes running around the corner. It's like, oh, wow, you know, I didn't didn't realize that was going to happen. It's another example. Um, but it's very easy for these pack track drivers to get very complacent as well because they're doing the same monotonous over and over, back and forth, back and forth. Same with chopper uh, operators. I mean, if you've ever climbed up in the cab with the chopper operator and just watched this corn spiraling into this uh, header, it just, it's almost hypnotizing. It can make some people um, like, have vertigo and, and seasickness. So if you have, if you're prone to that, maybe don't do it, but uh, it, it, it can really, really just get your, uh, your mind in a different area. Now we're not paying attention. So there's a lot of activities we do in silage where complacency can, can catch up to us. So uh, Bolson himself had knocked a finger off uh, trying to unplug a blower. Well, I, you know, I'd unplugged it many times. Well, yeah, you, didn't wait till that thing stopped before he tried to reach in there and and uh, took took a chunk of his hand off with it. So we've already seen a couple examples of this, so it's not really a surprise that anything related to farming, uh, we're dealing with big trucks and tractors and a uh, tremendous amount of accidents, as you can see here, um, over 250 related uh, fatalities every year in the U.S. Um, that's a that, uh, that's a number that's just Hard to believe, but uh, that means every couple of days that somebody's dying in a tractor accident. Um, 
we have a lot of tractor drivers that show up in silage that don't drive tractors every day, especially in areas where we don't make a lot of uh, you know crops throughout the summer, uh, like we do on some of the places uh, where we keep a crew that stays busy from May till October. So always something to be aware of that there's a lot going on here. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, obviously we talk a lot about in our in our silage management the need for improving packing density. And so we see guys put a tremendous amount of additional weight on the tractor. Let's realize that that affects how stable that tractor can be. And so if you see some unsafe behaviors there, you know, don't be afraid to go say something if they've got the uh, machines overloaded. Uh, it's been several years, but Dan Bates and uh, had me come to Michigan State for meetings with with John Deere and one of the issues they were having in that season was a lot of people had grossly overloaded their equipment and were blowing transmission. So uh, if you can't get somebody's attention from a safety standpoint, maybe you can get their attention from, hey, not only is this unsafe, but it's it's dangerous for your equipment. Uh, certainly we don't wanna see any practices like this. I mean, this is simply unloading a uh, machine on a waterbed. And you gotta remind these people, this is 63%, 65% water. Uh, thirty-five percent dry matter corn silage. That's mostly water, man. And if you're going to pull this truck up on this, do you think you could do that on a waterbed, or could you do that on a mud hole? Uh, what kind of issues you're going to have there? Uh, obviously, that very dangerous scenario for lots of reasons. Not not uh, the least of which is the fact it's already grossly over the walls. Um, we know there's accidents caused by entanglements in the machinery, and I don't think anybody wants to go out by being chopped to death. Um, just what a horrible way to go. Uh, the last uh, run over that we know of was a was a, a young man in Michigan a couple of seasons ago that was uh, apparently trespassing in a field, but was run over by a chopper that didn't know he was there. Um, didn't get chopped, but uh, definitely got run over. And so this is you know part of our uh, big reason why we have the high visibility clothing. You know it could. Uh, it could happen to any of us. We're out there uh, working on uh, working with our clients and working around uh, this equipment. So obviously, you know, we talk about this quite a bit. But you know, if if you're approaching a a pile to get a sample, if you're approaching a, a, a tractor driver to talk to him or a chopper operator to have a discussion with him or her, you know, we we want to you know maintain eye contact, wave, get them to wave back, you know, make sure that they see that we're going to come uh, to them or going to be in their workspace so that they know what's going on. We can't just assume because we have our pretty orange vest on that people are going to, you know, stop and, and not run us over. So uh, obviously if we see some of the safety gear on the equipment like shields and things um, uh, disengaged, uh, or beepers that should be on loaders that are disengaged. Uh, I think this is one of those policies like at the airport. You, you see something, say something, because uh, it's just not worth somebody losing their life over these things. And um, you know, I think a very common problem that I'm starting to see is um, chopper operators that are texting and driving that um, you know eight row header chopper while they're going through the field. Uh, I, I've seen it multiple seasons in a row, and I think something needs to be said. Uh, certainly, I say something to them, but we need to say something to their managers as well, because I don't think that anybody thinks that's a safe, uh, you know, procedure. And again, here's an example of if we're going to be out taking samples, uh, doing that safely, and doing that away from uh, the pile, doing that with high visibility clothing. Falling from height is a real concern. Um, I I saw the numbers somewhere else, uh, but a staggering amount of work-related accidents are caused by falls, uh, whether people working in facilities, climbing ladders, things of that nature. Um, you know, we have a couple of different risks. Obviously, getting in and out of uh, large equipment uh, is a risk, but also being on top of a silage, especially when we're covering or uncovering, uh, removing the silage plastic. So we never want to stand uh, close to the to the edge if we're removing plastic, taking samples. In fact, we really shouldn't be on top of piles for any reason. Um, uh, once they've been opened and we have a face uh, exposed, and and obviously, uh, you know, this is just a silly way to uh, try to take a density. Um, you know, can't cannot do this anymore. 
uh, one slip of a foot or one slip of a lever in the cab, and those people are taking a you know ten twelve foot down drive excuse me ride straight down onto the concrete and uh, that's going to be a bad day for everybody involved <clears throat> now we've all seen the video and i so i uh glanced over it um but this avalanche and collapsing silage uh tends to be where a lot of our accidents are occurring um and it's interesting to me as i've been doing a lot of these safety presentations how many new people we're seeing come out to our feedlots and dairies for for work that are working on feed crews and they have no idea that this is a risk uh, when they see that avalanche video or they hear about this they're just flabbergasted that they didn't realize that that could be could be a risk now we're we're all familiar with this this risk in our industry but uh, more and more people continue to get uh, hurt injured killed uh, with these uh, avalanches so certainly make people aware of this and i think we probably should be talking a little bit more closely to these uh, custom covering crews as well you see these guys running up along these edges and at any moment that that silage could avalanche and uh, take them down with it from the top down not necessarily being on the, on the floor of the silo like we tend to think of so you know working with our clients on focusing on making sure that we have safe and normal heights you know there's no reason why the height of that pile should be any greater than the unloader and so as i'm helping uh prospects and clients design piles when they ask you know, first one of the very first questions i ask how how high is your unloader how high can you reach because there's zero sense in building a pile or designing a pile that doesn't fit what our unloading equipment can do. So we start there and work around other things uh, you know, as we go uh, as we go forward. Um, I'm seeing heights of loaders getting in the 20, 22, 24 foot range. And uh, depending on whether we're dealing with a rake or a telehandler could be 30 feet, but we need to have some serious discussions if we're going to uh, talk about a 30 foot tall pile about these risks uh, that are associated with that. And uh, obviously if this pile were to fall on uh, somebody, um, it's, it's, it's lights out and game over. Uh, very few people survive this, but uh, Doug DeGroff, who's also on the board of directors, uh, most of you know as a nutritionist in California, uh, did survive an avalanche from a you know relatively small pile. This pile is only about 10, 12 feet tall, but um, uh, Doug's doing very well today, but uh, took many, many years to recover from uh, this pile collapsing on him. Uh, Betsy brought this to my attention this year. I had some uh, potential uh, issues with this in North Carolina, uh, but the, the opportunity for uh, nitrogen dioxide to be produced during the fermentation uh, is, is always uh, a possibility. So uh, what can happen is, is if we get a crop, uh, typically it's a crop that either because of nitrogen applications at a, you know, maybe the incorrect time, or it could be drought stress, which causes the plant to uh, uptake this nitrogen a little differently. Uh, regardless, uh, we can get a fermentation uh, started in the beginning where we get uh, nitrogen dioxide produced and it's this toxic gas that does have a little bit of a smell to it but the problem is by the time you smelled this laundry chlorine type bleach smell is probably too late um, your our biggest indication is one uh, understanding the crop conditions and if we're at risk for it two um, it's going to happen in the first uh, day to three days of that uh, forage being put in the silo so obviously our risks are higher right you know during the silage making much more so than you know down the road two three months but uh, our, our biggest cue is that we're, we're going to see this reddish orange or yellowish brown kind of heavy gas it's going to be low which unfortunately is where our nose is it's going to be about five to six feet off the ground um, and it's going to go which whatever direction the wind is going so obviously if we see anything remotely like that we've got to stay upwind of that um, we've got to report that and we need to let everybody know that they should not go anywhere near or around that pile. Eventually it will dissipate and yes, the question always is asked, is this going to be safe to feed to cattle? Yes, it will be safe to feed to cattle, but after we've uh, got the nitrogen dioxide gas to, uh, to leave the pile. 
Um, I need to get a better photo of this. I say that all the time, but fortunately we don't see it enough to get good photos of it. Um, but here's an example of that reddish orangish brown kind of color here. Uh, it's sitting here low and, uh, <clears throat> this was the corn silage that was, you know, obviously packed yesterday and we're looking at it today. So uh, this can occur that quickly overnight. So if we see something like this, uh, we need to be aware of that and stay away from that. Me. And uh, obviously, every farm feedlot that we work with already has a drug and alcohol policy, um, but obviously very important to discuss in relate, relation to silage. There's too many big and uh, fast moving parts going on, so we want to maintain our drug free uh, workplace status at all times, especially when we're dealing with uh, silage equipment. And you know, it's it, it's worth mentioning this because you know, we say that there's these policies, but uh, you got custom harvesters that are coming in for a short period of time, and so do they know what the company's policies now? Obviously, we all out of common sense know that we should, you know not uh, be abusing drugs and alcohol when we're when we're doing work like this but um, I don't think it's too derogatory to say that we don't get the best truck drivers in the industry or in the world out there doing this job it's it's not a very desirable job it's not a very glamorous job and so there are some issues with this and we need to be aware of it so uh, probably the biggest thing to uh, to address is if we see something we see somebody doing uh, these kinds of things we need to say something so we're going to wrap up here and realize that uh, you know our goal in any silage program is to return everybody home safe every day and it really doesn't matter how good the quality of the silage is if our program's not safe nothing else really matters and so we've got to do uh, things correctly and we need to share this information with as many people as possible um, you know Keith always used to say every serious injury uh, or fatality could have been prevented and uh, if we really sit back and analyze what occurred you know the, there's probably ways that uh, you know we could have prevented that from happening so sharing this information educating as many people as possible encouraging people to uh, to get more information to read the safety manuals that we supply in all of our applicators and us being a part of bringing that message i think is really critical to the success of our customers and uh, i'd encourage everybody here if you're not doing safety training meetings with your customers yet um, either have me come uh, and i'll be happy to to train you further or get comfortable with doing it yourself because uh, it will enrich your experience with your customers and it will enrich somebody's lives. I can tell you a quick story. Uh, we did one of these out in, uh, in California. And uh, one of the things that we emphasized in addition to the safety program is that you guys, even though you know, you're air quotes, just a mechanic, you're in the food business and what you're doing is putting food on, you know, in front of animals, but that's putting food on somebody else's plate that you're helping feed the world. And uh, Richard and I got a really nice handwritten letter from this uh, person. It's like, man, I really appreciate the fact that you guys would take your time and uh, and educate us that we're not just mechanics that we are part of the food system and we just really appreciate you know what you guys do uh, to bring that information so it's really rewarding when you when you get those kind of interactions with people that you know uh, they're not our they're not our daily focus as salespeople we're talking to managers we're talking to owners we're talking to uh, nutritionists but we can't forget about the little guy because the little guy sometimes is the one that's out here doing the riskiest job and doesn't have this information. So if you could be the person that can can bring that information to them, you can be the resource that helps them do their job better. Um, that's very rewarding. So let's let's don't overlook that. So with that, I'm going to stop and open it up for questions. And uh,